and we'll put three payments on your behalf. Six o'clock. Okay. All right. So We're gonna get started right on time just because we have a lot of presenters and a lot of exciting information to share with you. So hi everybody, thanks for coming. My name is Elise Matera and I'm from the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. We call it Turk for short. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch the story of plastic and to engage in this community conversation about the plastic problem in our area. As we saw in the film, the plastic we produce and use here in the US impacts people around the world and often communities in the global south. We cannot ignore the connection between these problems and other forms of injustice that are at the forefront of many of our minds at this time. We are working forward towards a plastic-free future to create a more just and equitable society. And this is an important step in ending global environmental injustice. So thank you so much for being a part of this effort. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We've got a lot of good presentations coming for you. All right, and I'll put that in full screen mode. So thank you so much to all of our participants. Uh, we hope this conversation will fuel our actions going forward. Uh, first half of this will be just a few quick slides from our 12 presenters, and then we will dive right into the Q&A for the second half of the session. We have a great group of panelists who will each take a few minutes to share some of their current work to address the plastic problem, spanning from education to outreach to research and even to art. Uh, we hope that sharing some of our work will spark ideas and further conversation. So just some quick housekeeping if you are new to Zoom. The majority of our presentation will be done in this screen share mode. So as you can see, you uh, can have your uh, pictures of yourselves and of the speakers will be minimized up in the corner. Um, you can also minimize those even further if they are blocking your view of the screen. Um, if you are not muted already, please take a moment to hit the mute button in the bottom left corner so there's a red line going through the speaker icon. This is simply to improve the audio quality of our recording, but please feel free to type any and all of your questions about the film and about the presentations in our chat box, which you can locate at the bottom of your screen. When sending your questions, please be sure to address them to Anne Graham. She will be uh, recording all of the questions that we receive and typing them up so we can view them really easily during the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> if you would like to address your question to a specific panelist, so one of us, uh, please just indicate which speaker that you would like to address with your question. So let's dive right in. Like, like I said, my name is Elise Matera. I'm an AmeriCorps member and education programs associate at Turk. I'm gonna start out by explaining just some of the general information about plastics in Lake Tahoe. So these are just some annual stats that we have from uh, Lake Tahoe. Starting on the left, those are plastics that we have collected on an annual basis. So every year, uh, the League to Save Lake Tahoe has picked up this much trash just from, the, uh, just from the surface of the beaches. And then if you look in the middle, those are plastics that we have collected from the bottom of the lake. And so unlike the ocean, which is a saltwater body, Lake Tahoe is freshwater. And because plastic, is more dense than fresh water, it will actually sink. So this kind of disguises the problem, but it is still very much so a problem here in Lake Tahoe. And then the final thing I want to stress is that uh, plastics break apart, but they do not decompose or biodegrade fully back into the environment. So these pieces get smaller and smaller, and when they are under five millimeters, which is about the size of a grain of rice, they are considered a microplastics. A microplastic and those are particularly dangerous to our ecosystem and many of our panelists will also explain some of the research behind microplastics in Lake Tahoe. So this is just a sneak peek of an aspect of an exhibit we are creating at the Tahoe Science Center in Incline Village uh, which will open whenever we are allowed to. <laughs> it shows the chasing arrows symbol which many of us have called the recycling symbol and I that I have too. But what I wanna stress here is that just because the symbol is on a piece of plastic, it does not mean that plastic is necessarily recyclable. It just means which type of plastic was used to create it or the resin type. 
So if you look at these recycling rates under each resin type, you can see that number one and two over on the left are actually the most recyclable items. And those are things like your plastic water bottles, milk jugs, and caps. And still, that's only 25 to 5 percent that are ever actually recycled and that's just being sent to the recycling center whether or not it becomes something new is a totally different question and as you can see these rates move down as you go towards the right until you get to your styrofoams and your other category which includes things like bioplastics which are actually compostable not recyclable and as you can see these are never recyclable and so this is often due more to economic factors than to ecological ones. And that's something that they went into in the story of plastic film. But that is just your brief overview to plastics in general. And we're gonna move right along to the recycling experts in our area. Hi, I'm Jeanette Tillman. I'm the Sustainability Manager with South Tahoe Refuse and Recycling. We see everything that's thrown away in our service area, regardless of how it's collected. Our facility sorts, processes, an average of 225 tons of trash daily during our peak months. STR has long recognized the importance of landfill diversion by facilitating the separation and collection of green waste, food waste, and other recycling for post-consumer processing. Animal mitigation is also a very important component of clean recycling. Lake Tahoe is bear country. This speaks to the importance of maintaining access mitigation by wildlife and still conscientiously sharing the same space. Areas with populations dependent on tourism compel a greater number of single-use items. Disposable hangovers after weekends and holidays in the Tahoe Basin create massive volumes of waste. Hopefully a better understanding about the true impact of single-use items may help to curb some of the disposable habits associated with the false confidence in the recycling process. As increasingly new plastic products are infused into the planet in hopes it can or will be recycled, the less likely current recycling capabilities can keep up. It's like one step forward and three steps back. The earth is already full of leftover plastic. The truth is plastic does not fit into the recycling mold on a permanent basis. It does not just go away. Plastic lives on sometimes forever. What if instead you had to keep every single use item you've ever disposed of forever? South Tahoe Refuse has committed to diver diversion from the landfill through the composting of green waste and food waste collection. This is actually true diversion. Plastic recyclables are also collected for post-consumer processing markets. While recycling plastics can help to temporarily divert single-use items, ultimately they may need to be disposed of by incineration, dumped in landfills, or sent to worldwide destinations unable to process them at all. The most important part of the reduce, reuse, recycle triangle is reduce the use of single use to anything. This will help us all move towards the goal of maximizing the conservation of resources and a healthy local and global biocycle. Thanks very much. Madonna, can you yep. unmute yourself? Okay, let me. Hi everyone, Madonna Dunbar, Incline Village Waste Not and Tahoe Water Suppliers Association. Um, as Jeanette just mentioned, they're being drowning in the land in the, at the processing center in plastic. Um, the burden, if you watch the movie, the burden of plastic is being left on our communities um, and the responsibility is for someone else to clean up. Um, less than 9% of all plastics get recycled. Most of them are downcycled. We can all get our recycling collected in most places, but there really aren't the facilities in the United States to process these materials. All these materials used to be shipped overseas that halted about uh, two years ago. Um, and these materials are backfilling and backlogging and going to the landfill. Um, COVID has us all, we're using more single use disposable items. Um, but it also affected collection and recycling facilities. We needed, they needed to come up with better enhancements for safety for even just dealing with these materials. And plastic is still cheap. That's a big part of the problem. Oil is cheap, plastic is cheap. Right now, I mentioned a little bit while we're in COVID, um, this is temporary. I'd like to emphasize that we, I think we're gonna be able to get back to the great great start we had on people refilling and reusing. Water. This is a very easy one for people to reduce on. Your tap water in most 
places in the country is highly tested and highly regulated. There are some problem locations, but the bulk of tap water in the United States is extremely available and safe to drink. 50% of people going to buy bottled water at the supermarket, you're buying a repackaged tap water. We're doing, going through 60 million single-use bottles a day. That's also that oil I talked about. So when you're here in Tahoe, drink Tahoe tap. It's a luxury water that's basically available for free. If you have concerns over um, problems in the piping or you, you're concerned, there's a lot of information about filters. This happens to be a filter water bottle I'm holding in my hand. We also have a network of refill stations that we're going to be expanding upon. Um, people now may not be comfortable filling in a public place. You can always, always fill at home. You can always fill uh, where you're staying and just take your water out for the day. Don't buy the plastic water bottles. Hi, I'm Erica Mertens. I am with the town of Truckee and Keep Truckee Green and I um, manage our recycling programs. I wanted to talk to you guys first a little bit about how we collect our recycling in Truckee. We actually just finished up our third and final uh, phase of our new programs, which is exciting. Uh, previously, if you're familiar, um, just like most parts of the basin, we were collecting our recycling in blue bags. Um, and those were also single use plastics that were going to the landfill. So we have moved away from that and are now collecting our recyclables in carts um, along with our uh, food scraps for commercial and uh, yard waste in bins. And as Elise was touching on earlier, there are only so many um, plastics that are really recyclable in reality due to the global economy. So in Truckee, what we accept along with the other items is plastics number one and two. But we have been working um, really hard on a lot of initiatives to reduce the amount of waste that we have in Truckee and reduce the amount of single use. So one of the things that we've been working on is a reusable to-go box program. It's been piloting for the last two years at a handful of restaurants. Um, the way it works is you buy a green box one time and then exchange it out every subsequent order at um, a few of the restaurants that are listed below. And unfortunately right now, due to the times that we're in with COVID, we had to put this on pause, but we are hoping to get this back off the ground uh, shortly as the research actually shows that the reusables, if exchanged properly, um, are not any more dangerous than a single use item. And uh, lastly, just again, touching on the work that we've been doing for single use reduction, we did a full report that you can find on our website, which is keeptruckygreen.org. Um, and that details all of the research that we did, all of the um, community outreach and business outreach feedback that we received to try to craft uh, better policies in Truckee as we're working on adopting a single use reduction ordinance, uh, really focusing, like Jeanette was saying, on reduction um, and reusable. So saying no to things um, unnecessarily and having reusables available um, whenever possible. And then the last thing I'll touch on, sorry, real fast, is um, we do have our Truckee Day pick up um, this Saturday. That's happening Saturday uh, starting at eight o'clock. So all that information is on our website as well. Hello, I'm Patty Mullen. I'm the recycling coordinator for the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection um, and the Nevada Recycles Program. One of my jobs is to calculate the state recycling rate and we don't have uh, specific data for what is in the waste in Nevada, but using EPA's uh, most recent numbers we from 2017, we can see that plastics make up about 13% of the waste stream. Uh, next slide. And in Nevada, we are only 
our, our plastics make up only about 1.5% of what is being collected for recycling. Uh, the other thing to know is that private companies are in charge of collecting the material and marketing it. And so they don't have to tell us where the material is going. So we don't know where our plastic that is supposed to be recycled is ending up. Um, in, in 2018, which is the most recent statewide data we have, we collected about 14,000 tons of plastic, most of which is um, numbers one and two. And the 2019 data, data is just coming in um, now, and it actually looks like our plastic volume is, is lower than um, the previous year. So um, I wanna just say that while recycling is not the answer, it has to be part of the solution, at least in the short term, until we can move to a more circular, circular economy with a lot more reuse um, as we were doing before with the bottled, bill and you know deposits on containers and that kind of thing and as for covid um plastic uh the covid virus actually remains viable on plastic longer than on some other surfaces so plastic single-use packaging may not necessarily be any more uh any safer than reusables if we are you know properly cleaning our own reusable items um so Thank you very much. Hey everyone, I'm Megan Collins. I'm speaking on behalf of the Microplastics Research Group at ERI. We are an interdisciplinary group of researchers and educators who are looking at the microplastics problem in our area. Next slide. Microplastics, what are they? Well, as you might guess, they are tiny pieces of plastic that are smaller than five millimeters, but they can actually be as small as the width of a, a fraction of the width of a hair. And as you can see from this slide, they come from, they can be found in a variety of shapes and sizes. A couple of years ago, our group set out to investigate the presence of microplastics, wondering are they present in surface waters of our high alpine lake, um, Lake Tahoe. What we found um, in embarking on that journey is that the scientific community actually uses a, a wide variety of methods to study this. And so we thought in addition to investigating whether or not microplastics were present, we could make a contribution by by possibly furthering the techniques and improving the techniques that are used to study microplastics. So in our preliminary work, we used a high volume sampling method, which actually created a, a whole filter stack, um, which enabled us to look for microplastics of a range of sizes. And this is a diagram here that um, depicts the high volume sampling method in simplicity. What we found, next slide, is that there are microplastics in the surface waters of Lake Tahoe. Um, we sampled at a number of locations. Here are three of them. And you can see that there are a number of different um, shapes that we found, a lot of them being microfibers. Uh, microfibers are easily carried on the air. So they can shut off synthetic clothing and other sources. Um, so we're looking more uh, deeply into that. If you want to find out about other work that the Microplastics Research Group at DRI is doing, such as the collaboration with the League to Save Lake Tahoe, it's a community-based monitoring study on uh, microplastics presence in stormwater, or microplastics in snow, you can go to this website. Um, thank you for all the passionate people who are showing up to change. Cheers. Hi there, uh, it's really an honor to be presenting with this incredibly passionate group today. Uh, my name is Dr. Janessa Jeltema. I'm an assistant professor of zoological medicine over at UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And I'm also the head veterinarian of the Sacramento Zoo. Uh, I direct a research program evaluating the health effects of microplastics using a One Health perspective. Um, and I briefly want to share with you one of our new research collaborative um, projects that we're working on with the Tahoe Environmental Research Center. Um, in 2018 and 2019, samples of beach sediment were evaluated by the Tahoe Environmental Research Center, which revealed, um, not surprisingly, um, when you think about our last presentation, uh, the presence of microplastics. 
Um, and because of this uh, discovery, um, a, a new research plan was developed to really further characterize and um, quantify the microplastics at Lake Tahoe, uh, as well as determine their locations. Uh, so next slide. This study, uh, it's called To Sink or Swim, a snapshot study on the fate and type of plastics in Lake Tahoe, is a collaborative effort made possible through funding uh, support through the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection and also the Tahoe Water Suppliers Association, who provided funds for purchasing uh, the trawl net for this project. You can go on to the next slide. During routine sampling trips that are made for ongoing lake monitoring programs, um, samples are essentially collected from the water surface below the surface and in the lake sediment at the bottom of the lake. Um, this project also evaluates samples from filter feeding animals like clams and some fish uh, and local tap water. Uh, at the lab, the samples are digested and processed to isolate the microplastics uh, onto specialized filters. Um, and after that filtration, we perform Raman microspectroscopy, which is one method, um, to identify and characterize particles found on the filter. Um, molecules are constantly vibrating in different ways due to their chemical structures, and Raman analys analysis basically uses a laser consisting of a single wavelength of or color of light, uh, which is directed at the particle of interest. When the light is reflected, it may lose or gain energy depending on the molecule's vibrations. Um, and this results in some scattered light of different wavelength intens and intensities. Next slide. This scattered light of different wavelengths is then measured and graphed to produce a spectrum, which is kind of like a signature for the underlying material um, of that particle. Once obtained, um, you can use this chemical signature to compare it to a library of known materials in order to find a match. Um, and this allows us to uh, identify the composition of a particle. Next slide. Um, so what can we discover? Um, well, one thing we can determine is how much microplastics are present. Uh, we can also determine where they're most um, likely to be found within the lake and you know, what the hot spots are. Um, we can also uh, identify different types of plastics that may be in different places. Um, and we can also get a, a characterization of what kinds of sizes and shaped plastics we're dealing with. Um, uh, we uh, thank you so much for listening and we look really forward to sharing our results in the near future. Um, we'll take questions at the end. Heather, are you muted or have you disappeared? She might have disappeared if she used to be on the top of the list, I believe. Oh, I'm here, sorry. No problem, take oh, it away. There we go. Okay, so I'm Heather Segali with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center and I wanted to tell you a little bit about the latest version of the Drink Tahoe Tap campaign. It's part of the larger Take Care Tahoe campaign which has a focus on stewardship with fun, snarky messages that are designed to catch people's attention. The goals of the campaign are to raise the level of public awareness about non-point source pollution and its effect on the water, specifically looking at this emerging issue of microplastic pollution that Megan and Janessa have discussed. So we do that by increasing public understanding of the different types of plastic, reducing the use of single-use plastic, and hopefully that will reduce the presence of plastic on our, in our water and on our beaches. It's a two-year collaborative project that's funded by the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection that includes outreach, an exhibit, an education program, a pilot program with Braley's, shopper surveys, and the use and promotion of the TAP app. Um, Raley's has in Incline Village and then the other Raley's eventually located in the Tahoe Basin and the one in Truckee, We'll be purchasing uh, reusable Drink Tahoe Tap clean canteen bottles to display on a grocery store end cap right near the plastic water bottle aisle with the message, one less plastic bottle, well probably thousands. They'll be printing um, end cap designs that 
market Drink Tahoe Tap as the official bottle of the world's best water, so you can purchase that water bottle. And they'll be conducting a marketing and PR campaign. And this is just the start. Um, the next step includes development of the drinktahotap.org webpage and social media campaign. And here's some examples of the social media campaign language. The graphics are still being finalized. Initially, we had some concerns that COVID might reduce um, our impact of the campaign, but in the end, we decided that right now, people are buying cases of water in plastic bottles that are trucked up from down in the valley, and we should just move ahead and try to reduce the number of plastic bottles sold. So here's a sneak peek of our microplastics exhibit that's under development and will be on display in the Tahoe Science Center as soon as we can reopen. The top wall signage is blue and the bottom row represents hands-on activities that are on a table that include a beach sample, buckets to sort the plastic into each resin type, flip panels to discover the lack of recycling rates or the low recycling rates that can be shocking for some people because everyone thinks those chasing arrows means it's recyclable and we're learning it's not. Um, sieves to sort the plastic into different size classes, which is basically what the scientists are doing. Microscopes to investigate the microplastics and a solutions table for ideas to reduce the use of plastic. So we're looking for individuals that would like to join us in that effort to start with the simple act of reducing single use water bottle sales in a place that truly has the world's best water. We know this is a global problem and bigger than just water bottles. The simple act of reducing single use plastic water bottle sales is not enough. It's a great place to start, but a terrible place to stop. So we'll hope, we hope you'll join us and you can contact either me or Elise if you wanna get involved in the campaign. And um, Madonna is our Drink Tahoe Tap representative. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Hi, I'm Mary Lee with the League to Save Lake Tahoe. Since 1957, we've worked to advance restoration, combat pollution, and tackle invasive species. At the League, we've moved from science to solutions, and it's all about taking action. We make important scientific discoveries easily digestible for community members and then provide opportunities for them to take action and be part of the solution for plastic pollution. At the League, we see firsthand how litter impacts the environment through our cleanup efforts that we host all year long. Since 2014, volunteers have picked up over 60,500 pieces of plastic which includes straws, utensils, bottles, and other single-use items that are used one time and thrown away. Plastics are the top trash found. As you've heard earlier, plastic is harmful to wildlife and it leaches out chemicals in the water. Through our Keep Tahoe Blue Litter Initiative, we take the data that is collected by our volunteers and use it to advocate for change. This data was instrumental in passing the 2015 plastic bag ban and the 2018 styrofoam ordinance in the city of South Lake Tahoe limits. It also helps us to identify where cigarettes canisters should be installed through our cigarette disposal pro program in partnership with the Tahoe Water Suppliers Association. We offer many opportunities for you to be part of the solution by forming a Tahoe Blue Crew and adopting a litter hotspot to clean and protect it, by becoming a pipekeeper volunteer to help us monitor and manage stormwater pollution entering the lake. And of course, participating in one of our many neighborhood and beach cleanups, such as our massive July 5th cleanup held across the basin. To get involved, visit keeptahoblue.org slash events. We have virtual Blue Crew training scheduled just next week, so you can be a part of the solution and clean up litter hotspots with us and collect important data. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee, and thank you everyone for being here. My name is Colin West. I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization in the Tahoe Basin called Clean Up the Lake. So our flagship project for this nonprofit is a 72 mile scuba cleanup of the entire lake. And obviously that goes to say that the area of our focus or our niche is really cleaning up what's underneath the surface of Lake Tahoe. And so what drove us to do this was back in 2018 and 2019, our organization, as well as one of our close partners, did two scuba cleanups that resulted in 1,000 pounds of trash in less than one mile of shoreline of Lake Tahoe. 
And so this is going to be a big organization that I really wanted to start diving, sorry, a big project that I really wanted to start diving on four days ago, but unfortunately due to COVID, we will be starting this in June 2021. And our plans with this is to take four to eight divers around the entire lake, and we're going to be diving through waters that are zero to 30 feet, finding that kind of highest, highest level of trash or hot spot within that area. At the end of the cleanup, we're working with Tahoe Public Art and Tahoe Fund to put a long-term art installation of the trash that we pull out from under the surface in Boatworks Mall in Tahoe City. And while we're down there, we don't just want to clean the trash, but we will be collecting data on all of the trash that we're pulling out. And we're partnering with some local organizations and setting up those relationships now. And while we're underwater, we will have radio communications with divers that will be tracking heavy lift items that we have to go back to remove, as well as tracking hot spots in areas that trash is accumulating. Next slide, please. So with our organization, our mission really is, of course, as with this 72 mile cleanup, to get rid of the old trash. It's not the overall solution to plastic pollution, but it does need to happen. And then with our program services, we want to drive home other projects. So this summer, we are fortunate enough to have funding by Nevada Division of State Lands and Nevada Department of Environmental Protection to do six miles of scuba cleanup in Nevada. Uh, we're doing a cleanup bingo next Sunday on the 14th. Everyone's welcome to join in on Instagram Live and we'll be hosting other community cleanups. Finally, we have different education, like a social media campaign where there's 30 plastic free swaps in 30 days. Um, and in the future, in the near future, we're gonna be doing a Donner Lake scuba cleanup, a citizen science program that's gonna work on tracking and reporting trash, and some plastic free advertisements with some connections into the film industry. And moving forward, of course, we wanna look at research studies uh, with Zoe Harold, one of our contract environmental scientists, and some of the organizations, TARC and DRI, that we are currently setting up relationships with. Um, finally, of course, with a background that I've had in film and television, we want to use media to drive public awareness and hopefully in the long term future work with other agencies to focus on legislative changes. And finally, Lake Tahoe is, of course, our first stop, and we hope to grow this organization globally. Thank you. All right, Silver, can you unmute yourself? There we go, sorry. Hi, I'm Silver Hartman I'm from the California State Parks. I'm an environmental scientist there. And I would like to share some information with you about Below the Blue. Um, it's a community art and outreach project. And for some background, um, for many years, parks and MTS divers, Seth and Monique and their crew, have partnered to survey and remove Eurasian water milfoil, which is an invasive species from Lake Tahoe. Um, while MTS was diving for invasive species, they discovered an underwater garbage problem and removed trash along their transects. In addition, they have volunteered their time and equipment to remove debris from sites all around the lake for the last eight years. They recorded the location, date, type, et cetera, of all the debris they collected. This graph only shows data from 57 distinct locations where the invasive species removal occurred in 2019, and only light trash is reflected in this graph because it was done in tandem with invasive species removal. Um, already this year, they have pulled out 6,300 pounds of trash in 2020. Next slide, please. Um, Seth and Monique decided to save a portion of the garbage to raise awareness about the issue. And when state parks heard about the underwater situation, we knew we had to do something to help. As a result, Below the Blue, Lake Tahoe's Litter Crisis Partnership was born. And four of goals of the Below the Blue is number one, to inform the community about the existence of garbage in Lake Tahoe and the types of garbage that affect the lake the most. To educate the community and the environmental reproductions of garbage and plastics in particular in fresh water, water ecosystems to identify ways to stop the introduction of garbage into Lake Tahoe and to empower people to take action. Next slide, please. So below the blue garbage art and science exhibit was scheduled for last May, um, but has been postponed due to COVID-19. But when it is rescheduled, it will have all kinds of art made from the garbage Seth, Monique and their crew have collected. Um, Here's a list of some of the examples of the art that we've made already. 
um, State Parks worked with Tahoe Lake Elementary grades TK through four to create five large scale photo collages of the garbage. The Girl Scouts are making um, lamps out of crayfish traps. Swept, um, we'll talk, who's gonna talk next, did these really amazing um, paper mache animal heads surrounded by garbage. Lots of local artists are participating and many, many more. So if you're interested in all, in making art out of garbage, please let me know and I'll hook you up with some trash. Um, while we are waiting for, um, looks like some of my stuff's missing from my slide, but while we're waiting to be able to do our um, art exhibit, um, we are going to do a live stream underwater dive um, with the California State Parks Ports Program. Um, this is really exciting because it will live stream the divers removing the debris from the bottom of Lake Tahoe. It will help promote Below the Blue, which will be coming soon, and it will spread awareness about the garbage in the lake. It'll allow the public to experience the dive process through social media and provide a forum for information sharing and question and answer while the divers are collecting trash. Um, I can post more information about when that is um, soon. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me personally in my emails below. Thank you. Elise, did you freeze up? It looks like maybe Elise is frozen. There she goes. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be part of the panel tonight and have the opportunity to be part of the discussion. My name is Ashley Phillips and I'm the project director with Sierra Watershed Education Partnerships or SWEP. And over the last 25 years, SWEP has been working to promote stewardship in the Tahoe Truckee community um, by connecting students to their local environment through service learning and environmental education and watershed education projects. Um, we host over 15 projects, K through 12, throughout the school year, and many of those projects focus on introducing students to the science and the problems with plastics. Um, at SWEP, we really believe that the students of today are uniquely adapted to be able to handle some of the challenges we face both in our society and in our environment. Um, and we feel our role is to empower those students um, to be able to use their voice and to advocate. Um, so I am going to pass it over to some of those students right now so they can tell you a little bit more about their plastic-based initiatives specifically. So first, um, Ben and Evan, you're up. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Evan Anderson. I'm the president of advocacy for the Truckee High School Environmental Club. And I'm Ben Anderson, and I'm the president of communications for the Truckee High Environmental Club. Um, we also work closely with SWEP on some other projects. Um, so what we do at the Evolution Club is a wide range of different topics related to sustainability and involving um, high school students. Um, but plastics is our flagship and integral part of advocacy. Um, and the major way we do that is through Trashin, which is trash and fashion. Um, so it's an inspiring message that we deliver to community members and schools um, about environmentalism. And, and it's in a positive and digestible way for young students. Um, so a big part of thinking about the next steps is looking to youth and educating them. So as they grow up and they start becoming consumers, um, they can make conscious decisions um, and inform their peers and family and loved ones. Um, so it's all about that community outreach um, to better our environment. Um, so that just creates that um, forward, environmentally minded sustainability um, which I'll let Ben touch on. Yeah, so Evan and I have been in the audiences of trash and shows since elementary school and for a lot of North Lake Tahoe kids a lot earlier than that. And it's definitely created a foundation of being environmentally conscious within our community. Um, we present at, uh, trash and shows in a way that's very applicable um, to students and exciting to watch for elementary schoolers and middle schoolers in particular. We identify specific contributors to the waste problem. Um, for example, in the corner of the screen on the right, right bottom corner, you can see the mermaid straw outfit. 
which is both interesting to children and it reminds them to think about the ocean. So it creates a visual presentation of what they should be thinking about. Um, we hear all the time about kids going home after the trash and show and being inspired about how to consume and they communicate that with their family members. And it really causes a desire to create a greater change, which we saw in the film. So thank you guys. Hi, my name is Logan Phillips, and I'm a member of the North Tahoe High School Envirolution Club. Um, in addition to the Trash and Show, SWEP Sustainability Clubs have been involved in some plastic free initiatives at our school and within our community. Um, TerraCycle, which is an organization that upcycles things like pen, juice, pens, juice pouches, chip and bar wrappers, and um, among other things, has been impl implemented at all Tahoe Chucky schools. Um, at our school, the Envirolution Club started a campaign to reduce the amount of single-use plastic that was being used. And each month we focused on a different type of single-use plastics like water bottles, uh, bottle caps, straws, utensils, and plastic bags. Um, in the Chaho Chucky community, our clubs took part in the Skip the Straw campaign. We went to locals, local restaurants and businesses and spoke with owners and managers and asked them to move to a straws by request model. We are proud to say that most businesses that we talked to have switched to straws by request and when they requested, they offer plastic free alternatives. All right, thank you to all of our presenters. That was awesome to hear from all of you. And I am just going to switch over. We've had some of our questions uh, written out for us by Anne, and I'm just going to share those and direct them to the most appropriate person. Or if they aren't directed to a specific person, we can just uh, first come, first serve. All right. So this first question is for Jeanette, Madonna, or Patty. Is there any plan for a reusable to go box program in Nevada? Uh, this is Patty. So uh, one of our other listeners, Skylar Jones, is actually um, attending as well. And so that is one thing we've been researching. And uh, um, Donna Walden has a uh, green dining, is heading the green dining district in Carson City. And they are also looking into um, starting a green box program in the green dining district in Carson. So we have been looking into um, doing that. So hopefully we can learn from Trekkie and um, move ahead with that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question is, I recently read an article about barcoding plastic to be able to trace back pollution to individuals and groups. Are there any ideas of how to, of ways to hold people accountable for plastic pollution in the Tahoe area? And I'm going to give that to anyone who knows anything about that. <laughs> I am unsure. This is Jeanette with South Tahoe Refuse. So um, I think, I don't know if this is what you're referring to, but there's a Producer Responsibility Act that is making its way federally and through different states at different ways. And what they're doing is they're not so much uh, tracing back uh, the individual use. So for example, when you get scanned by a barcode and it, and it gets rung up on your receipt and it gets attached to your debit card, um, I think that there might be some privacy problems with that. Um, however, keep, um, keep heart because there are things going back to the producer of the original product, things like um, plastic bottles and plastic items, that they're going to be held accountable to, uh, number one, either reduce the amount of resin that they start taking as a virgin material, and or um, making sure that a portion of their products contain recycled plastics. I hope that answered your question. Awesome, yeah, that's a really great point and kind of making that difference uh, between individuals, actions we can take as individuals and actions that need to be taken on a wider scale from the production end of things. Just uh, so uh, thank from you. a microplastics perspective, uh, it's really hard to barcode such tiny little particles. So unfortunately when plastics break down into smaller pieces, sometimes that would not you know, be possible. Thanks, Janessa. All right, our next question is, what is the best way to share information with others about our local and the global plastic crisis? Heather, do you wanna address that one? So I don't know what the best way is, but this is one step is getting everybody together. Um, and now we have, a, we have a group 
of people that are interested and now are connected um, to try to share what we're each doing so that at least we can coordinate and collaborate about what's happening in our region and try to figure out um, who's doing what and where there's overlap and what things still need to happen. I would be curious about um, looking for uh, ideas from the group of what might be missing or what might be um, ideas for ideas for ways to share information that actually might work. There are also a few uh, national campaigns. We've got the Break Free from Plastic campaign, hashtag Break Free from Plastic, which was uh, started by the Story of Plastic uh, producers. Um, and there are also a variety of other social media folks who are working on this problem. Um, many of us are present on social media, so give us all a follow. I'll send a follow-up email with all of our information. Um, but if you wanna do individual sharing information, I think that's a really great place to start. Start with people who love you and have some investment in your opinion um, and just sort of send them some resources, explain to them that this is something you're really passionate about. And I think that's what I've found is the best way to share information about the plastic crisis. Um, does anybody else have any input? I can touch on that too. So for, for youth especially, they really enjoy tangible and visual things. Um, especially like elementary schoolers and middle schoolers. So things like the trash and show or other ways that they can visually see things that are going on is like a fantastic way. Cause when they hear about it, it's hard for them to, you know, visualize what's actually happening. And then for older kids um, and college students, social media is a great way because, you know, it's in their feed, it's connected to them and it really just relates to them personally. So yeah, visual things really help. Thanks. Anyone else? I was going to jump in and say, obviously, in support of social media, but not it's more in not in support of spreading information about the crisis as much as it is about bringing about that change that we want to see. And I think, you know, one thing our organization has done was last June, we did a, a 30 day plastic free challenge where it was giving up any and all plastic and challenging other people that you knew to join in on that. And this month we're doing 30 different plastic free swaps in 30 days. And I think rather than just talking about the problem, if you actually are part of the solution and you start to find ways to convert away from plastic and you make that decision to use a wooden toothbrush or toothpaste tablets or a reusable coffee mug and you spread that to your friends and your network, that can begin to go viral and get more people actually becoming part of the solution and not the crisis. In particular, I think if you're talking about the Tahoe Basin, there are so many amazing organizations that are collaborating, especially right now, to make sure that the message is out on, on the positive way to make change um, with the different uses in plastic. And um, I know that most of um, the organizations are linked by their Facebook pages. So there's a lot of posting that goes on and there's a lot of sharing that goes on with some pretty valuable information and incredible tips on how to reduce the use and how to recycle um, and what to recycle. So um, I know um, the haulers have, so as haulers, you see everything that comes through. Every single thing that you throw away or an individual or a commercial business throws away, we see it. So um, it really helps for us to take, get a look at the, the volumes of what type of plastic is being thrown away or what is actually being contaminated and having to be sent to the landfill. Um, for uh, South Tahoe Refuse, we have collaborated with the city of South Lake Tahoe, El Dorado County, and Douglas County with a podcast um, called Tahoe Trash Talk. So we try to keep people informed on what's happening in the basin, um, give them some links to a special events that for cleanups, et cetera. And then um, we always welcome questions and um, any kind of information you want to share on the podcast. So it's podcast at SouthTahoeRefuse.com and there's my plug. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. What are the human impacts if you ingest microplastics? So I can probably, yeah, I can probably take that question. Um, so we're, we are still in the process of learning what the health effects are from microplastics. Um, and so, you know, we do know that there could be potentially 
Um, physical effects, so you know the particles that you ingest um, can physically interact with your body. Um, there can also be other things like uh, toxins that leach out of plastic. So a lot of times when they're producing the plastic, they'll put plasticizers or different compounds into the plastic in order to make it melt in a certain way or more sturdy. Um, and so those uh, can sometimes leach out um, and potentially be a, 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 a toxic compound. Um, and then there's also um, some concern that the microplastics could um, transfer um, or be a vehicle for um, other potentially harmful uh, substances. So um, other types of pollutants that might be in the environment or wherever that plastic was, um, or uh, potentially pathogens. So we're finding that bacteria can sometimes grow on the surface of small plastics as well as um, maybe even some parasites. Um, and so we're still learning about that. Um, they currently think that um, most drinking water um, that humans consume um, with the way that it's processed in most cases uh, tends to be less of a risk, but, um, but certainly there's still a lot for us to learn about. Thank you. I want, to, I want to touch just a second on the water. As uh, Janessa said, um, tap water is starting to be tested for microplastics. This is considered an emerging contaminant in the state of California, and they're actually setting the rules right now on how the sampling is occurring. And then um, in about two years, the uh, state water board will be addressing this as, is this something that the water board is going to need to start to consider in as contaminants in drinking water. Um, there is a lot of concern over bottled water because um, they're finding microplastics in bottled water and they do find microplastics in tap water, but it, they're finding it in bottled water due to the action of cracking the cap actually in many cases. So um, I'm still voting, rooting for tap water because I think we have the win on having less of this potential contaminant in tap water. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Here's a long one. What are the panelists' opinions on enforcing fines on people that pollute the lake with trash? Could something such as a task force be created to monitor beaches, especially on holidays, to enforce fines and or educate people on proper pack-it-in, pack-it-out etiquette? Anyone want to tackle that one? I'll take a stab at this. Uh... <laughs> um, one goal of the ta the dialogue here has been kind of to get TR to the how regional planning agencies attention on micro on plastic. Um, they have the overarching ability to do rules and enforcement on both sides of the lake and in, in multitude we have five counties and cities. Um, so this is a big ask. Um, Education, of course, is a softer approach. We're all we're all educating and we're all trying. Um, I run a solid waste enforcement program here in Incline Village, just about keeping your garbage locked in your trash can to keep it away from animals. And I will just share that that is it's a big challenge. People do not like to be approached about doing garbage wrong. I think this is one way, like trash police. It's one path, but I don't know how we pull this off. Um, it's an interesting idea. Um, I think, again, it's kind of what Colin mentioned of peer pressure can go a long way. You see somebody doing something wrong at the beach, you know, politely say, hey, we don't do that here at Tahoe. Part of the big part of the Take Care campaign is to create a cultural norm for visitors and locals that that talks about it in not just a, a talking headway. We have the characters and, and they're kind of funny. So you get somebody's attention, but then you give them the information. Um, hey, I Donna, I, I, if I can jump in, I'm on your side. <laughs> you go ahead. 
Okay. So um, Madonna and I both, we, I do the animal mitigation on the South in our, in our franchise area. And she, to her point, it is nearly impossible to get people to contain their garbage against animals. It's really hard. We send out notices, we send out fines, et cetera. That said, one thing that really helps with messaging and um, behavior is, is consistency. So within the Tahoe Basin, we have a few different jurisdictions that cross over. If all of the jurisdictions are sending the same message, sending the same item, even if they're gonna do a fine, as long as they're all saying litter, if you litter, it's this much fine. If you do this, there's this consequence. But consistency in the message really helps give it strength and pulls it along so that people understand. So if they are in South Lake Tahoe, but they cross over the state line, there's not two different rules. So consistency and message, and I think these organizations that have worked up so hard, including the people on the panel here, they're all sharing the same message. And so if we can get some reinforcement with that, that would really help. But um, trying to litigate people's behavior is, is challenging at best. Better to um, create a culture where so certain behaviors are acceptable and certain are not, my opinion. Could I chime in? This is, oh. Go ahead. Hi, I'll just um, add in a few things. And uh, I'm representing an environmental nonprofit, so I'm going to come from that standpoint. And um, litter is something that is not illegal. And so seeing enforcement for people that are littering would be great to see in the basin. Um, to add on to the task force concept, the Tahoe Blue Crew program that we have is to tr um, train individuals and groups to an adopt a litter hotspot. And through that, we train the volunteers about uh, Keep Tall Blue messaging to have them um, be armed with education and more information on how to talk to people if they're approached or um, other messaging to support efforts to remove litter and spread awareness to other people. Um, we are working on creating a leave no trace trainings and inviting nature stakeholders and people around the basin on um, education for the public. And so all of this has kind of been worked on as far as educational volunteer perspective um, with the league. Go ahead, Colin, I'll go after you. Okay, yeah, I was gonna chime in and say, really respect the question, obviously, you know, I've been in different states and different areas where you see, you know, thousand dollar plus littering signs and it tends to be a little bit cleaner. Um, one thing that, you know, I've seen here in Tahoe is the multi-jurisdictional issues. So, you know, I'm sure Marilee would probably have sound knowledge into what those fines are that probably exist somewhere deep in books in the different jurisdictions around Tahoe. But to try and get all of those jurisdictions together is always a hard task. I mean, for our 72 mile cleanup, it's Nevada Division of State Lands, California State Lands, four different counties, a city, um, national parks. So there's so many different people that you have to rope in together. But I think if there's a way to increase signage on whatever their independent fines were, it would be wonderful. But yeah, hard, hard nut to crack. And I would just to add that. Um when MTS has been collecting trash, and as I mentioned, they were collecting data regarding the garbage, they found that the garbage is in um, a number of categories. So there's construction debris, um, recreation trash, marina trash, um, fishing. So there's all these, there's these buckets that the trash is coming from where we could um, apply pressure. So if you are working on, Piers, for example, most of the trash below the pier is construction material from the pier being constructed or the old pier being removed. So that is a really specific thing that you can um, sort of address and try to stop. Um, that you could apply the same tactics, you know, as you guys all mentioned, trying to get people to stop doing their own recreation trash. But there's these other categories too. Um, like I said, marinas and construction trash, lakefront, um, properties. A lot of the garbage is um, directly from a lakefront property. Um, so there's these places that we can definitely apply pressure. I think it would be great. Thank you all. One thing that I would personally like to add because you're asking for opinions, um, <clears throat> I'd like to bring our attention back to that scene in the film where they talk about if your bathtub is overflowing, you're not going to take a spoon and scoop trash out of it, you're gonna turn off the tap. So I think this is this could be a great stopgap um, 
but potentially does not address the uh, root of the problem, which is the production of plastic. And if we're putting those fines on individuals, we don't know the income of those individuals, uh, we don't know their backstory, but if we are putting those fines instead on the producers of uh, plastic, I think personally that is a much more holistic and uh, um, a better solution to the problem. But I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, it is also 6.59, so if anyone needs to log off, we understand that. There will be a follow-up email with all of the uh, contact information for our panelists, as well as some follow-up links for how you can take what you learned today and put it into action moving forward. Um, but if the panelists are comfortable with it, I'd love to get through these questions. I think uh, y'all are bringing up some really great points. Um, so if you can stay on, please do. Um, so here's the next question. Are there any panelists involved on a national or global level in regards to keeping manufacturers accountable for finding ways to reduce single-use plastics? And that's a great follow-up to the point I just made. Anybody wanna chime in? I could talk on a plan that we have in the future. Um, it's probably three years out, but uh, my background's been in, in film and television production. And I think when, when public awareness is driven by programs like that that are just massive, like Blackfish, the documentary that was done on killer whales, it can have an insanely large global impact. And so one thing that I'm planning on investigating further as I dig deeper into environmental filmmaking is understanding more of the law around documentaries. Because when you start holding people accountable for everyone that did watch that, they talked about someone landing in their yard with helicopters and firing shots. <laughs> and, you know, once you start actually holding people accountable, it, it becomes dangerous, but you're also getting into an area where, you know, you might not have a permit to sit and, you know, film something that someone does not want filmed on their property. So that becomes also a message that needs to be told. And that's when things like constitutional rights and freedom of the press come into play. So, um, you know, as, as a founder of this organization and a filmmaker, I'm going to be further exploring those efforts and those parameters that we'll be able to operate in and hopefully do a series that does actually target uh, those corporations to hold them accountable. But again, that's probably a three to five year plan for us. So um, one thing I would like to add, this is Janessa Jeltima. Um, Science can be a really important tool to use to influence policy on a national uh, level. Um, and so we're definitely, as a scientific community, uh, trying to explore really the links between microplastics in the environment and health problems um, and health effects. And if we can, you know, characterize those a little bit better, a lot of times that gives people who are making policies a lot more, um, uh, you know, scientific evidence to base those policies on and um, can sometimes help move things forward in the right direction. And I know that on a national level and global level, um, we're, we're working together to try to, um, you know, figure these questions out. Uh, this is Patty Moen. So there's a couple of things going on um, nationally. There's a U.S. passed plastic pact that um, a group is working on. It's the Recycling Partnership. The, McEll the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Wildlife Fund are working together um, on that to get manufacturers to um, have at least some recycled content in their products. Um, so I'm involved in that in a little bit. And then there's also uh, like three different federal pieces of federal legislation right now. And I know that they've been working, you know, even with the, what's going on with the COVID-19 um, stuff, they've been working on, you know, not kind of pushing that to the forefront and not letting it um, die by the wayside, the break free from plastic. And uh, I just saw something today on it so that, you know, they're trying to, when we do these um, stimulus packages that we don't forget about where we were headed before all of this um, came to light. So there, there's a lot of stuff going on and I try to keep up with it and do, do what I can. You know, I'm just one, there's, a, there's two of us in Nevada. So we're not like California that CalRecycle has, you know, 265 employees, but 
We try. <laughs> so this is Heather, and I just wanted to say that the Story of Plastic website takes you to the Break Free from Plastic um, website as well. There's a bunch of corporate campaigns that are, um, when I was looking, when we were looking for the exhibit about action items, the thing that's really frightening actually is that if you go to take action and you go to the corporate campaign section and you sort by North America, there's a bunch of green pea sections. There's things about um, really calling out Coca the Coca-Cola company and Nestle. Um, if you sort by North America, guess what comes up? Nothing. And the same thing was true with the past plastic pact is there is a plastic reduction pact that's being forcefully pushed through in Europe and it is not in the United States. And I think that our, the way that our government currently is set up is there's so much money in big oil that we have to really address. It's a, it's a big, it's a bigger, scary, harder problem that definitely requires a lot more effort by a lot of people. Thanks, Heather. All right, uh, this is specifically for Patty Moen or anybody else. Uh, the story of plastic talked about plastic pyrolysis and the toxic fumes resulting. Nevada will soon have such a plant operating near Reno. What do we know about its planned emissions? Uh, I think that's the fulcrum plant and um, I am not involved in the air permits. I know they do have to get air permits for that. So um, I'm, I really can't answer that. Um, I, I do believe they've broken ground. I know that they have a sorting facility for the um, that's right near the Lockwood landfill, but I'm I'm not sure how soon they will be operating. I haven't really been in on those talks, so I'm sorry I can't really answer that one. Anybody else? That sounds like something we need to research further. That's, I'm curious, uh, the location of that and how close it is to humans and then the environmental justice concerns related to that, if there are toxic fumes. It's in, it's at the Tahoe Regional Trick Industrial Center, Tahoe Regional Industrial, out by where Tesla and all of that. Um, it's out, out it's out right there. Story, yeah, I believe it's Story County. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that I would like to live near a plant like that, but we'll see. Um, we'll have to do some more research. All right, this is a two-parter. Uh, where are the major hubs around Lake Tahoe where microplastics accumulate? And is there a way to tell others or an agency about areas where I commonly see plastic trash and litter? Great question. I think we've got some answers for you. Megan, do you want to take the first stab or do you want me, do you want me to go for that? Um, I'll take a step and then I'll pass it to you. Um, I, what, I'll, what I'll start with is by saying that microplastics can take many forms. Um, Elise opened the panel by saying that plastics can be found in different densities. Some of them float, some of them are suspended in water, some of them sink. Uh, UC Davis is working on plastics in sediments. Um, other, other people are studying plastics in air, in soils, and um, the, the state of the science right now is um, at a point where we need to actually model sources and sinks of microplastics in different parts of the watershed in different parts of a system. And so this question of where are the major hubs around Lake Tahoe and where microplastics accumulate is actually the, the question that's on the tip of the tongue of a lot of scientists at the moment. To be able to identify um, mitigation tactics, we need to have uh, evidence that suggests this is where we can find them, this is where they're coming from. And so this is a, this is a really important question that um, our group and, and we hope to work with others um, as we pursue, as we pursue this very question. Yeah, so that is excellent answer, Megan. Um, I was going to say that for the floating plastics and they fresh water, they don't float in the same way that they do in the ocean. 
um, as much. They're, they end up in the sediment or on the beaches. But after large wind events, Lake Tahoe has two major gyres, a northern gyre, which actually um, goes counterclockwise, and a southern gyre, which goes clockwise. And those push, perfect, Elise, you're amazing. Um, <laughs> and those push the, um, you can see in this animation, if the animation will run, I don't know if that's the actual, um, get to it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a still. I can try to find the, find the GIF, the GIF as, as you talk. <laughs> yep. Um, or I can switch and take over, but basically the, you can see the gyres in that, in that um, graphic. And so what happens is it blows up and so Hidden Beach and the kind of the northeast shore gets a lot of the, um, the, tra the plastic from floating. And then um, Marla Bay and the southeast shore get a lot um, as that happens because basically uh, the, the currents are blown by wind that comes out of the west and is heading easterly and is coming out of the um, uh, lateral moraines on the west shore and get push, it's pushing all of that water across and it sets up these two large surface current gyres that really move the surface around. But because in Tahoe it's fresh water and most of the plastics eventually will sink, um, they are ending up at the bottom of the lake as um, the clean up the lake and MTS and the below the blue litter crisis group has indicated. Um, we are also curious about the filter feeders and the size. So we'll, we will be looking at the um, kokanee salmon and the Asian clams to see how much they are um, accumulating. I want to answer the other question about ways to tell others or agencies. Um, if you see trash or litter in a place like a public trash enclosure, it is worth contacting the owner of that public trash enclosure to let them know it's overflowing because you know that that's going to blow around and end up, um, you know, floating and end up in the beaches, end up on, in the land, end up becoming a problem, causing bear problems. Um, we also have created the Citizen Science Tahoe app that has a very simple litter trash um, section. So it's just citizenscienceTahoe.org and that takes you to the website. It's available as an Android, as an iPhone. And the league, um, hopefully Marilee can add to this, um, do, through their program, um, they are also tracking hotspots. But you can use that litter trash app to tell me where you, tell us where you see those hotspots. And then um, we are notifying the various folks um, it's not instant, but it does happen. Um, but, and so what's, what would be more instant is if you saw a actual large trash enclosure, um, you know, a commercial trash enclosure is tell that business who owns that enclosure or tell that, um, if it's parks or if it's, um, whoever owns that particular facility. Um, also, uh, Clean Tahoe, you can call them. They have a crew that patrols over here. We have a, um, a partnership with them. And if there's a mess and the, the people aren't there for whatever reason, there's a lot of visitors. So um, they're able to deploy troops or people <laughs> to uh, clean up the mess. And then they also issue a citation or a violation notice to the owner um, through the um, parcel system. So they get the address and they're, they're ready to go. Also your local hauler, um, you can let them know as well whoever does your trash service. And then that way it kind of keeps you out of the loop in case you don't want to cause any kind of conflict with people. So it allows us to, or the, go through a little bit different, a little bit easier way to keep you kind of anonymous if you want. So um, either of those two things can help. Awesome. And, um, those are great answers. And echo off of Heather, um, we are working with um, Turk on the Citizen Science Litter app. And we also, um, the league, the whole territory um, that we look at is the Tahoe Basin. So we collect data throughout the basin from our uh, cleanup initiatives, but also want to know where their hotspots are so that we can hopefully get those areas adopted by Tahoe Blue Cruise. So we do look at the data and take concerned citizen reports and we'll follow up with the person that submits the report um, to see the best solution. All right, and I think we just have time for a couple more because we are already 
15 minutes over, but here is the next question. Uh, if there was one piece of plastic commonly seen in Tahoe that you could ban, what would it be? Plastic water bottle, slits. Um, I guess I'll go first. This is Marilee with the league. Um, the top trash found is cigarette butts. And the thing with cigarette butts is 98% of them are plastic in the filters, which means they don't biodegrade. Um, we have seen bans. Um, kudos to Incline. I let Madonna talk more about that possibly. Um, but we um, are seeing that with California State Park beaches. But to see it lake wide would be great to eliminate uh, cigarette butts left in the environment and then all of the single-use plastics that we also find like straws and utensils and things that we use one time and throw away uh, would be great to see banned as well in a dream world. <laughs> um, Marilee mentioned that Incline Village uh, has banned cigarettes on their public properties. They are establishing uh, designated smoking areas only um, at certain facilities. And um, we're not known in Incline for taking a stand in such a manner, but it's really gonna make a great uh, effect on the beach. And the Tahoe Water Suppliers Association, which was one of the programs that we run through Incline Village Waste Not, and the League to Save Lake Tahoe have acquired uh, these really nice stainless uh, metal cigarette bins um, that are available for public land areas, for businesses, um, and so you can contact either the Lead to Save Lake Tahoe or Incline Village Waste Knot. We still have about a hundred of these stations available and we would love to have them all go out the rest uh, um, in the summer. So um, uh, park, it, we're starting to see cigarettes more in like parking lots and hopefully we're getting them off the beaches and away from the water, but they're, they're still around. And I wanted to make that resource available to anybody who's listening who might have a business or know of a good location for the cigarette bins. Awesome. Thank you all. And I'm going to call this next one, our last question before I share our final action screen and I'll leave that up. So, uh, the community worked hard to get plastic bags out of Rayleigh's and it's discouraging to see that they are back. Any thoughts as to when we can get paper bags back and when we will be able to use reusable grocery bags? So I know currently you are able to use reusable grocery bags still under uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. If you bring your reusable bags, what you have to do, it's kind of like a multi-step process, but bring your groceries to uh, the conveyor belt. Once you check out, then you can reload them back into your cart, unpackaged, take it to the parking lot, <laughs> grab your bags out of your car, pack up your bags in the parking lot, and just the same as you would. Uh, before. And I know sometimes uh, it seems like an extra step to take that plastic free uh, solution, but I, I think most of us can agree that, that it's all worth it. Does anyone want to add? Well, um, any, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and, and go back to the store and say, we really, we really want to be able to use our paper bag, uh, reusable bags. Um, there's no evidence showing that plastic bags are more sanitary than paper or than paper bags or your reusable bags. Um, so some of this is going to be being a, a an informed and vocal consumer. When you go to Rayleigh's next, when are you going to bring back uh, letting us use our bags? Do we know? And do it in a polite way, but until if it's kept in the consciousness of management things usually get a quicker movement. Yeah, it's what, what, Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say one more question that came in related to that topic was about the proliferation of plastic little packets of mustard and Parmesan cheese and soy sauce and everything that everyone's getting single use those. And I think the answer to that is that you actually have to say, I deny those things. Like, don't give me the, the fork. Don't give me the catch up, mm -hmm. I'm not going to use it. Don't, you know what I mean? And so then that just becomes a consumer choice. And it's tricky. Um, the, even at the grocery store, you have to say like, don't bag it, just put it back in the cart. I'm going to bag it in my, at my car. And then I look at you like you're crazy. But mm -hmm. if ever, the more people that do that, the less crazy it is, right? 
Heather, exactly what you said about um, just refusing the and requesting that you don't receive that item is exactly kind of the first step and also something that we are working to instill in our ordinance, draft ordinance. And to Mary Lee's point, if the, one of the major plastic things that are left over is the to-go utensils and the, the single-use items, keep in mind that um, over 50% of the homes in the Tahoe Basin are for um, visitors, and those homes are fully stocked with dishes, silverware, all kinds of reusable things. They really can say no thank you to the extra um, packaged materials, no thank you to the single use utensils and no thank you even to napkins sometimes because those homes are fully stocked. I mean, over the top. All right, thank you to all of our panelists and participants. Um, I'm just going to put up our last slide, which is some of those action items that we talked about. Um, so feel free to take a screenshot or pull out your phone, take a picture of this slide. Um, so that way you can remember uh, some of the things that we talked about today and uh, implement some of those things into your life. Um, and some of those simple changes can go a long way, as well as joining those national movements uh, and international movements to end the global plastic pollution crisis. So thank you all so much. I will be sending out a follow-up email probably tomorrow, which includes a recording of this session, as well as some of those links and uh, more concrete things that you can do. Uh, to be a part of solution. Thank you all so much. And if anybody else has anything to say, speak now. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Great job. And we can leave this on there for everybody. And if you don't know how to uh, take a screenshot, there's a little print screen on your keyboard, or you can just take your phone out and take a picture. But I think that um, Elise will also send this to everyone. Yep. So it was great to have such an audience at top audience rates. We had 53 people on the on the line. So that's great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate everyone's input. I learned a lot tonight. Thank you. <laughs> this I is too. Great, you. So. great to connect with all the plastic warriors. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. That was good. Do you want to end the recording, Heather? Because people yes, can just pause there. Awesome.